uh, about uh, one hour uh, for this call. And uh, we request that everyone uh, to mute uh, when you're not speaking. And uh, if you have a, a question, please uh, do raise your hand or use the chat box uh, to type your question. Uh, we will go through a short uh, presentation uh, from the team. I uh, just uh, it explain about the program and what we've been doing, and we will have a, a session where we will have a Q&A uh, that will um, uh, allow the rest of the team to ask questions. Uh, since uh, time is not on our side, I'd like to just begin uh, so that those who are joining then uh, would um, get us wherever we are, but also we are recording the session uh, so that those who are able to join us today will listen to it. Um, Okay. Yeah. Okay. Apologies for that. So, um, briefly, uh, Mani QC stands for maternal and newborn. Uh, and um, can can you please mute? And uh, the program was in, uh, goal was to improve the quality of care for mothers and babies in Kenya in line with the FCDO goal for investment of m and in Kenya to reduce maternal and newborn mortality. And if you look at the map on your right, you were working in four counties, uh, two are the coast region in Mkosa and Kuala, and uh, two are the rift region in Kericho and Nandi. So uh, just a, a brief background about the program and why, of course, uh, Kenya and the counties that we went to. Uh, we know that our Kenya maternal mortality ratio is still quite high, uh, way above the SDG goals at 362, 100,000 uh, 100, live births, and also our perinatal mortality ratio uh, is high still at 29,000 pregnancies. In 2017, uh, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, together with the Ministry and the rest of the partners, uh, funded a report that uh, did a confidential inquiry on maternal deaths. And unfortunately, nine out of the ten maternal deaths that were audited uh, resulted due to substantial substandard care. And really, really, that's why our program has been focusing on the quality of care. And in terms of uh, the investment, FCDO has been investing on m and in Kenya from 2013 actually to 2023. And uh, options phase one started in 2015 to 2018 in Goma County, focusing on health system strengthening for maternal health and the County Innovation Challenge Fund that some of you may know that was being run in six counties. So this phase that we're going to discuss today is the phase two of the project, which was a three-year period from April of 2019 up to March of 2022, and this was implemented in the four counties. And on your right, you see our technical approach. Uh, mostly we want to, um, we were looking at improving the survival of mothers and newborns, uh, and, and looking at three main technical approaches on the mentorship of healthcare workers to upskill in terms of managing of complications, um, we're also uh, supporting strengthening of NPTSR and using that evidence to improve quality of care and measuring uh, health facilities readiness to perform health system strengthening. And just in the middle there, you see a mother with the HSS of the health system strengthening, meaning that the evidence that we get from the uh, um, service delivery interventions was used to um, advocate for some of the health uh, system strengthening approaches, which the team will be taking us through uh, shortly. Um, without so much ado, I'd like to welcome George. Uh, uh, George is our MNH uh, officer based in uh, Nandi, and he will be taking us through the immigrant assessment. Over to you, George. Thank you very much, Gladys. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. 
um, like Gladys has said, I'll take you through the EMOC assessment uh, uh, component that you are carrying out. So on to the next slide. So uh, I'll, be inter I'll, I'll, be, I'll be using quick and EMOC words interchangeably. And what quick simply means, it means quality of institutional care. So this is a process where we collect data from the facility and then we analyze that data and then we do a presentation. And after that presentation, we call the stakeholders and do a dissemination meeting whereby the gaps, challenges that were picked during the data collection are acted upon through um, uh, action plans from uh, at facility level, at sub county and at county level. So as a program, we supported 93 facilities in four counties and assessed them uh, on quarterly basis. And we had nine rounds uh, that we did. We built capacity for the healthcare workers on quality of institutional care. Next. So um, when we're doing the dissemination, we, we do we actually do the dissemination through sc uh, scorecards and uh, dashboards. And these are just samples of how those uh, scorecards and dashboards look like on my on the left, uh, the one which has so many reds, that is the scorecard that we share with the facility and um, the one on the right, uh, that is the dashboard and this dashboard we actually share with the county and sub county level. Next. So what were the results? Uh, I'll take you through the proportions of facilities that had the capacity to perform EMOC signal functions. By EMOC, I mean emergency obstetric newborn care. These are signal functions that are WHO uh, uh, embedded. And um, just looking at the graph, I'll take you through. We started, uh, we did a baseline in July uh, to September 2019. And out of the 70 facilities, only 9% were able to attain the EMOC status. That means they're able to attain all the nine signal functions for this for, for those comprehensive caregiving facilities and seven signal functions for the uh, basic caregiving facilities. So uh, as we continued doing our implementation activities, you can see that the trend kept going up. Yeah, and at some point we were heavily hit by COVID. But uh, as you can see, uh, we had a resilient system. We were able to continue ensuring that uh, we sh were not uh, shifting focus from quality of care, but at the same time as we tackle COVID, we're also looking at the maternal and newborn care. So the graph went like that, and sometime in October to December 2020, as you can see down there, we have noted the number of facilities that we're assessing, but in October 2020, October to December 2020, we only assessed 12. And why did we assess a small number? Because at that time, there was uh, in Kenya, there was a, uh, an industrial healthcare worker strike. All the healthcare workers had gone on strike. So that is why the percentage really went up with the fewer facilities. And of course, the subsequent uh, assessments, we went back down, of course, post uh, strike period and all that uh, uh, is, is actually highlighted. And then we exited from Mombasa sometime uh, in uh, uh, April, August, and we moved to Kericho. And that has been there. The, the 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 trend we slightly went down and then slightly picked and and just to note that uh, when we started the program we started with a few number of facilities around 70 but uh, discussions with the county we were able to build up on the facilities that we assessed and 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 we uh, uh we went up uh, if you look at uh, the, the the two counties that we were with the numbers actually went up so some of the key issues that came out from the assessments were that facilities were lacking essential drugs and actually, um, due to the erratic, uh, the, 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 the actually out of stock. And, and Mombasa, uh, still, uh, it's good to report that even after we left, they've been doing out the quarterly assessment. The county was able to borrow in from this particular approach, and they are continuing with it. With it. So this is sustainable. Next. So just to take you through the design, and the key principles of the EMOC assessment uh, tool. Uh, what we do, what we what we tell our audience and even stakeholders is that this is a low cost, uh, low resource uh, uh, tool. You're able to collect data regularly, and then it's fast to administer. You just collect data within 20 minutes using a phone, and it's fast to enter that data into the phone. And of course, uh, generating the scorecards is also an 
easy task and it's fast to understand because we use cockards which are having the traffic lights easy to understand next some of the key lessons from quick stroke emoc assessment of course using this data we've been able to drive quality and uh, of course through these uh, scorecards and the data that we've generated we've, be, we've been able to share evidence and and uh, we've, been, we've been able to pick service delivery gaps and uh, from these gaps decisions have been made at the highest level at the chmt level whereby they've been able to allocate resources uh to 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 support that and also um it has been a success because uh it's a quality of care intervention so we've been able to complement other quality of care interventions which are being carried out in our counties for instance mpdsr quick and mpdsr go hand in hand the gaps that are actually picked from mpdsr and those uh, that are picked uh, during quick assessments are merged together and this builds a stronger quality of care approach in our facilities it's a good advocacy tool because from this we've been able to demonstrate and use cockards to prompt facilities to ensure that they are able to uh, push finances to ensure that equipment infrastructural gaps are, high, are actually addressed for instance i'll give an example back in kwale county lunga longa sub county hospital we used to do the assessment and ideally a maternity uh, flow is supposed to be slanting theirs was just plain so because we're doing regular assessments, that area was always red. So what they did was they allocated money there and they were able to redo the flow and it became a slanting flow, which is the correct one. And then the last one is, of course, with the changing times, uh, mobile health technology uh, care is, is something that we need to embrace. And uh, we took that path and uh, adapting. We did adapt to create uh, an M Health platform to be able to uh, address the quality of care gaps through the EMOC assessment tool. Thank you very much. Back to you, Gladys. Thank you, George. Um, and um, uh, guys, if you have any questions, uh, please do keep them. Uh, we have a Q&A session, but you can also uh, type in the chat box. I now want to welcome Daniel Omolo, who is also a management officer based in Kericho County, to take us through the EMOC mentorship. Uh, Daniel? Okay, thank you, Gladys. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So I'll build on what George has already presented, um, and this is on EMOC mentorship. Of course, based on the assessments that were being done and even the um, uh, uh, initial uh, baseline uh, review of the data that was available in our counties, the project initiated an EMOC mentorship intervention. EMOC mentorship is basically um, an intervention that was meant to build the capacity of healthcare workers on, on EMOC skills, especially those to address key obstetric and newborn emergencies. So what was the approach that we used? First, we began by selecting mentorship uh, centers of excellence and developing mentorship materials, including the resources that were required to actually implement the mentorship uh, intervention. So these uh, centers of excellence uh, were basically referral centers which were receiving most of the referrals from the peripheral facilities. As you know, most mostly you find that if there are complications from peripher peripheral facilities, they will be referred if the capacity of the healthcare workers at the peripheral facility is still uh, not at par. So at, after selecting this uh, centers of excellence we as a project we uh, ventured into standardizing the quality of care and again this one this one was done together with the county health management team members just ensuring that the quality of care that was being prov provided at the centers of excellence were standardized in terms of ensuring that they are uh, using the available uh, guidelines and 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 th the management that are being provided uh, to mothers and babies are at the same level. Uh, after we did standardize that, we went further in terms of uh, mobilizing health facilities were, that were going to participate in the mentorship approach. Basically, looking at uh, which facilities are generating most of the referrals, so that we can be able to capacity build the healthcare workers in those particular uh, facilities. We then went into recruiting me me mentees who are mentored at the at the uh, centers of excellence, basically 
getting time off to be able to uh, visit the uh, the centers of excellence to be mentored. Uh, of course, we had got ment mentors who were based at the, at, at the centers of excellence. During this time, we continuously reviewed and gave feedback to both mentors, mentees, and the uh, county health management team members to be able to refine and improve the mentorship approach. So in total, we were able to enroll uh, 303 healthcare workers, out of which 286 completed the mentorship uh, 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 intervention, basically having graduated at, at, at the end of the program. Of course, we had got a few challenges. Some of the mentees dropped out. In total, we had got 119 health facilities who, are, who benefited from the mentorship approach. We had got a total of 33 mentors and the entire approach led to a number of uh, results including one being able to contribute to the national uh, uh, mentorship package which actually contributed to development of mentorship manuals in the in the country and also development of the uh, uh, the assessment tool the emoc readiness assessment tools So overall, uh, there was there was remarkable improvement in the in in in, in mentee scores because at, at the beginning when mentees were being onboarded, there was a baseline assessment which was being done at the ment at the mentorship centers, just ensuring that they are able to respond to an array of questions, asking them about their confidence level on, on implementation of particular skills, especially those with regards to the key signal functions that are, are required uh, uh, to address the emergencies that mothers and babies may be able to encounter. And at the, at the beginning, uh, the score was at 65% at, at end line when they were graduating after, 10 uh, at, uh, after an average of 10 days, you realize that the performance level at, uh, was at 93%. And one key uh, result that we realized also is that the mentees uh, were able to borrow a lot of learnings from the centers of excellence, including being able to put into place operate, uh, or standard operating procedures that they did not have initially, being able to build the, the, the kit, the emergency kit that they, they needed to attend to their to the mothers and babies. Next. So key lessons that we learn from our mentorship approach. Number one, we realized that healthcare workers are able to learn better and faster in actual work environment, uh, as opposed to classroom setup. Initially, the government had got an approach whereby healthcare workers could be taken to a classroom setup, basically maybe an hotel environment to learn uh, about EMOC, EMOC uh, skills. But you realize that when you bring them to an actual uh, health facility environment, they are able to uh, learn these skills and they're able to practice them on uh, real life situations on, hum on actual human beings. And so this actually build their confidence also in terms of being able to learn the skills and practicing it, utilizing it on real emergencies. And we also realized that uh, mentorship does not only um, um, uh, build the skills of healthcare workers, but it go a, a little further in terms of strengthening the entire health system, looking at mentees being able to gain knowledge and even skills to be able to improve the overall infrastructure of their facility, being able to know that these are the equipment that we need to be able to respond to emergencies. So it doesn't only leave it at building the capacity of a healthcare worker at the facility level, but it goes a, a little further in terms of even uh, having uh, more impact on the health system. And again, in terms of scalability, we realized that we only mentored a few mentees, but the impact that we that 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 we realized, if you read even our our our, our other publications in our, in the website, you realize there is a huge impact that mentorship approach brought on board. And if we are able to scale it, then it it means that we can even create a bigger impact on the entire health system, not only in the county but also in the nation. If it is a, 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 if it is um, taken over by all other counties, and again in terms of sustainability, 
it is an approach that is is not uh, resource intensive it basically uses the locally available resources you, uh, realizing that we use the facilities that are already available in the county we use the mentors who are already uh, employees of the county and so it means that it is something that can be sustained as long as the county is able to realign their their their, their plans their budgets to ensure that they are able to incorporate everything and and that will add to the strength of the sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much, George, for that. Um, again, please do note your questions. And now we would like to invite uh, Kelvin Gaere, who is the Health System Strengthening Officer based in Nambi, to take us through MPDSR. Kelvin? Uh, thank you, Gladys. So welcome to our presentation on MPDSR. So basically our our MPDSR activities have been evolving around identifying the causes of maternal and newborn deaths and taking measures to be able to make sure that those preventable causes of maternal deaths we are able to actually eliminate them. So our approach to MPDSR uh, focused on well, during our inception we trained 145 trainers of trainers. So these trainers of the trainers in the four counties, they were now supposed to cascade the training from now to other facilities at the sub-county level. So far, 347 healthcare workers were actually trained on MPDSR, but these 145 trainers for trainers whom we had earlier trained. Our approach to MPDSR uh, revolved around, uh, uh, we, we implemented in, four, in the four counties, uh, reaching out to 22 sub-counties and directly supporting the 70 facilities. So we had MPDSR activities happening at the facility level, sub-county level, and of course at the county level. Uh, one of the key uh, items, we are, or key focus areas of our MPDSR is actually to be able to review causes of maternal and prenatal deaths and be able to take reviews and be able to actually upload or report those particular cases into our uh, Kenya Health Information uh, National Reporting System. Uh, so when you are starting with uh, in between, uh, as you can see from the maternal death uh, uploads, back in 2018, only 17% of those maternal deaths which were reported were actually being reviewed and reported uh, to the national level. Uh, but then when you look at towards the end uh, in 2021, you can be able to see we've been able to make sure that 99% of those maternal deaths in the, in the specific counties are actually been uh, reviewed and uploaded into the KHIS. Same picture for the perinatal deaths. In 20, 2018, only 2% 2 deaths were being uh, reviewed and reported. In April to December 2019, when we were starting the project, uh, the review, review and upload rates were around 31%. But then as we are exiting uh, this program, you can be able to see uh, we are actually uh, doing around 62%, which is quite which I'll say we've been able to actually double these uh, particular numbers. Next. So uh, our focus for MPDSR is the response part, whereby we want to make sure that those causes we've identified as to be leading cause of deaths, we are able to avert them. So we actually support the counties to make uh, uh, improvements in service delivery or infrastructure at the county level. And these are just some of the key things or key improvements that we've seen in the quality of healthcare. Like for example, over the past three years, seven new uh, sub-county hospitals have actually had their theater facilities being operationalized, which means mothers are able now to access uh, the syrian section and blood transfusion facilities in those counties. Uh, you can also be able to see the country has budgeted to and uh, budgeted and actually made procurement of medical equipment. You can be able to see Nandi County procured 10 ambulances, while Kericho procured two ambulances just to be able to improve on a referral system. You can be able to see other facilities they've been able to procure like ultrasound, oxygen concentrators, uh, refrigerators for the uh, for blood, for maintaining the cold chain for the blood. And actually one of the key things we did for uh, is actually equipping, uh, supporting the the Kericho and Kuala County to be able to actually equip their blood satellite. And it's important to note that Kuala County is now able to actually screen its own blood. So they are like self-reliant in terms of being able to actually collect blood, screen, and make sure that that blood is available at that point when it's needed. 
Uh, our support, we extended our support to 13 additional private facilities. Uh, these facilities are now able to actually uh, review MPDSR, develop action items, and just be able to actually make sure that they are able to ensure this mothers are uh, actually well. What have we learned from our MPDSR activities? One is inclusivity of MPDSR communities. When we are handling these particular MPDSR communities, we engage different cadres and different uh, levels of management, like the facility management, the CHM, uh, the county management and also the sub county management. We've also integrated some of the hemovigilance hospital transmission committee activities and hemovigilance meetings into the MPDSR so that we just have like a wider panel of people being able to actually review so that we have a comprehensive approach to causes of to uh, actually preventing causes of maternal and newborn deaths. Uh, then of course one of the key is that it's always important to implement to actually have the duty bear or the key decision makers to strengthen the response part. Whereby if you have a, a, the chief executive uh, officer uh, for health attending these meetings, some of those high level uh, then response uh, actions, actions can be actually be picked up by the chief uh, and be able to actually be implemented at the county level. So basically that's what we've been able to actually achieve uh, in our MPDSR, it was just making sure maternal and newborn survival. Thank you. Thank you, and um, Kevin. And we will now want to talk about the health targeted health system segment. And uh, and then Stanley prepares to come in just to mention that uh, this component actually was added to the program uh, during the second year after we you know we, we looked at all the components that we are, were implementing on service delivery, and we thought. No change would come, you know, if we do not look at some of the health system strengthening uh, activities. So I'd like to welcome Stanley Kori, who is a, a health system strengthening officer based in Kerito, to take us to the next session. Stanley? Thank you, Gladys. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to everyone. Okay, I'm going to take you through the uh, some of the health system strengthening targeted activities that we've been supporting in Kericho. One of them was on uh, IMO vigilance. We also supported planning and budgeting, healthcare financing, human resource for health, and health management and information systems. Next. Yeah, in IMO vigilance, we supported uh, the counties to ensure that their blood was available. Remember that uh, one of the leading causes of the uh, maternal deaths in, uh, in Kericho and uh, the, folk, the other three counties supported by the project was uh, due to postpartum hemorrhage. So as a result of this, we were able to develop, uh, uh, we were able to train uh, 120 participants from the four counties on hemovigilance. Uh, through the training, we were able to form the hemovigilance committee and uh, also managed to form 16 uh, hospital transfusion committees set up across the four counties. Uh, we also mentored four staff from Kuale on screening. Uh, remember, as Kevin had mentioned, is that Kuale can now screen their blood. And uh, we also, a uh, blood donor feature was uh, also aired in, K in KTN, and that was uh, as a result of the support that we had given to, to the county. Some of the supported activities here were why is that we normally support the hospital transfusion committees, which we integrated with the uh, MPDSR, and it is held uh, on a monthly basis. We also support the quarterly county uh, immovigilance review meetings, and uh, here, by, here we discuss the issues uh, surrounding blood and uh, gaps, and uh, we come up with action plans, and uh, even come up with the implementation plans to address some of the issues. We also conduct uh, two sessions of blood drives each uh, 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 in every month. And uh, as a result of uh, our support, we've been able to collect 18,516 total number of blood banks. Next. Yeah, another, uh, another uh, intervention that we support is on healthcare financing. Remember that in, uh, even in the health systems uh, building blocks, one of the key a uh, building block is on healthcare financing this, uh, since it bolsters all the other components. And uh, we supported the counties to ensure that they pass their F5 bills, and this would ensure that uh, the financial autonomy of the facilities. Uh, remember that uh, also that 
the, uh, the facilities needed to plow back the revenue generated at the point of service delivery. And this would be only ensured or this would be implemented through availability of regulations and even policies. Uh, as we talk, Kericho County uh, passed their FIF bill and now have a Kericho Health Services Act uh, 2021. Uh, regulations are ongoing and this will ensure that the, the, the revenue generated at the facilities are retained at the point of service and this is going to improve the quality of service delivery at the facilities. Uh, we also have uh, strengthened the NHIF services at the, at the counties and uh, we brought in the NHIF team to ensure that the facilities are sensitized on the importance of making the NHIF claims and also the Linda Mama. And as a result of this, we have seen the facilities increase their claims on the Linda Mama and uh, they have now developed some of the services at their health facilities, including the purchase of medical uh, maternity, medical equipment, and even the non-pharmaceutical drug uh, supplies and also the essential drugs. This was not realized before due to the delays by the counties and the, even the national treasury to release the funds. We have also supported the counties to develop their annual work plans, their annual performance reviews, and even uh, engage them through sector working groups. And uh, as a result of this, uh, so most of our MNH activities have been included in the annual work plans and even prioritized at the annual performance reviews. One of the key milestones is that uh, before the onset of the project, uh, the counties used to receive a low amount of uh, allocations or funds from the Transforming Health Systems project. It is a World Bank supported project and mainly it, uh, it allocates funds based on the performance of the indicators. And uh, as a result, you could see that for Nandi in financial year 2019-2020, it used to uh, receive 61 million. And uh, after our, the onset of the project or the interventions that we imparted in the county, it was able to double its allocation. The same thing to Kericho. Yeah, next. One of the components also that we support is on human resource for health and uh, we supported Nandi County to develop uh, the HRH document and uh, this would provide, uh, this would guide the county on uh, the recruitment, the retention and even the distribution of its human resource for health and uh, as we talk now it is a functioning document which is being used even in the uh, in the in the distribution of the the workforce the health workforce in the county another component or the another intervention was on health uh, management and information systems and uh, this was the, this was a, a set to improve the mnh data quality and uh, some of the targeted activities that we did here or supported the county was to conduct the data quality audit which was done on a quarterly basis and also the monthly verification of data and as a result of this we have seen an uh, improvement even in timeliness of uh, reports to KHIS. The completeness, many facilities now are now reporting to KHIS. We have also seen the obvious errors or the outliers in terms of data improve and uh, uh, sorry back a bit. Yes, uh, improve. And we have also seen the counties now utilizing or consuming the data from these, uh, 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 the, the data from the some of these uh, interventions to even make uh, decisions or allocate their resources. Yeah. Next. Some of the key lessons is that uh, we saw that for the for the facilities to improve their quality of service delivery. Uh, they must uh, we must legislate the facility improvement uh, bills and uh, this will ensure that we ring fence 100 percent revenue generated at the facilities this will improve the service delivery at the facility level uh, we have also we also realized that uh, establishment of immovigilance structures and uh, committees is a way of ensuring that the blood is sustained the blood supply in the counties is sustained and uh, before the, even the onset of any project or uh, design, we should uh, include, uh, uh, we should support the laboratory services uh, to ensure that uh, we have a collaborative and uh, 
in a integrated uh, system to ensure that we have the blood supply. We also, uh, we also launched that it is crucial for the counties to allocate budget for the managed interventions, especially through the annual plans, as you know that the county systems or the government systems implement activities based on the annual work plans and uh, to even uh, prioritize some of these MNH interventions in their annual performance reviews. And uh, we are, uh, through this, uh, we have seen even in the recent annual work planning process, unfortunately, we left before their completion. Uh, the counties uh, were now beginning to include some of these uh, interventions, some of these uh, maternal and newborn health interventions in their annual work plans. And uh, this will be this is one of the uh, approaches to sustain some of these activities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stanley, for that. And uh, as we end the presentation, definitely um, the past few years have been uh, challenging for everyone globally, and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic really disrupted our project implementation. And of course, during that uh, period, there were also, you know, cutting and limited travel, and and therefore access to maternal and newborn health services uh, was uh, interrupted. And you clearly see from the data from MPPSR there was increased uh, mortality and also immigrantness and, and and also the other interventions. Uh, secondly. The project scope was reduced in year three. We all know the issue of uh, FCBO reducing their funds, and really uh, this led to around a four month reduction of uh, the period of the program that really affected uh, a lot of our transition uh, planning. Uh, the third thing is uh, the six month health worker strike. We also saw that in 2020 it really uh, impacted a lot of uh, our interventions, although the team has really been. Uh, adaptive and flexible, uh, really to ensure the activities continued uh, at that time. Um, another challenge, of course, um, uh, you know, contextual issue with Kenya about you know flow of funding from national to the county level that really impacts a lot of uh, annual work plans uh, and budgets uh, that the counties have um, you know planned. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, we are now uh, off to uh, Sarah, just to share a um, few insights about the overall lessons that we've learned as a project, and also answer in the Q&A session. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Gladys. Thanks, everyone, for the presentations. And um, so just to wrap up on a few um, overarching lessons from the work, um, and one was that the project was designed to strengthen service delivery, focusing on quality improvement mechanisms. But by having a broader health systems thinking lens at the centre of the theory of change, enable the team to think um, beyond the confines of <clears throat> the service delivery health systems building block um, by recognising the in interlinkages with all the other subsystems. Um, and this allowed the team to be flexible and to adapt, particularly in the face of COVID, um, and allowed them to support the county health management teams to ensure that the um, service could continue during the pandemic and to address other bottlenecks that were affecting quality of care, um, such as the human resources uh, for health policy and to support counties in creating <clears throat> the legal environment to enact and implement the uh, facility investment fund mechanisms and to support the blood transfusion services um, in strengthening haemovigilance. Um, and just on that point, I think strengthening the laboratories and the blood transfusion services has been pivotal uh, to ensuring quality of care for health services. And obviously that's especially important for, for pregnant women and babies where um, obstetric hemorrhage is one of the major causes of maternal deaths. Yet um, blood transfusion services are often the Cinderella of health services. So just to note to ourselves that we need to ensure that we consider the laboratory and, and safe blood transfusion services when we're looking at health systems. Um, importantly, the team have been very flexible and adaptable. And this type of commitment has been really important in sustaining the progress and keeping the interventions moving, especially during the pandemic. Um, also, though, there was a very close and positive working relationship that had been nurtured um, with the team between Gladys, the team leader, and from the previous team leader of the money programme um, with the donor. 
and that allowed the team to show how flexible they were to be able to respond <clears throat> to urgent requests for support. And that included the work through short term technical assistance to support the Kenya vaccine implementation readiness assessment for COVID um, and the support to the government as the government developed their first COVID, COVID vaccine plan. Um, and of course, um, the work done by the team leader and the, the team have been supported through robust um, programme management systems and expertise. Um, so have another important point has been having the team members based and embedded within the devolved health system at county level and that's been really central to their success. Um, this created the environment for the team to build trusting relationships with their government counterparts and key stakeholders and allowed them to be um, responsive to their requests for support and technical assistance and, and enabled them to really co-create approaches and tools that worked in those particular settings. Um, it also allowed the team to understand in a very deep way the localised context and, uh, and issues. And this context-based um, adaptation and implementation has really been key for um, creating ownership and locally relevant approaches that um, encourage continuity and sustainability. So I'll stop there and we would now like to open the floor for any questions for the team or reflections on the project. So um, please fire away. Oh, I can see a few hands up. Um, I didn't see who was first, but I can see Ellie's hand up. Thanks. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to all the Money QC team for this really rich presentation and these valuable lessons. Um, such impressive results from this program. So well done to all of you. Um, I was really interested in the quick tool and when you started off using it, how did you get buy in to to be able to use it? Was there any resistance about having a new tool? Um, yeah, interested in hearing about that. Thanks. Thanks, Ellie. Um, should we take one question at a time? I can't see if anyone else has any hands up at the moment. So who in the team would like to respond to Ellie? Please just uh, open your mic and step in. Hi, um, am I allowed to respond? Yeah, go ahead. Please do. Was that Daniel? Please go ahead and respond. Oh, George, I beg your pardon, George, go ahead. Yes. All right, thanks. But just to answer Ellie, yeah, um, when we started, we started uh, using that tool way back in Bungoma, and we used to call it the quick PBF tool. It was such a long tool, very, very long. It had almost um, nine areas of assessment. And when we uh, entered the four counties that we were implementing in the money QC program. We had a sit down with the CHMT, the sub county, and a few representatives from the facilities. We did show them the tool that we would want to use to assess uh, issues on quality of care. They had a look at it and they were able to refine it to suit their context. So we had their buy in. We brought the tool. Uh, ask them to see if the areas they would wish for us to be able to incorporate or to be able to remove. And they did that. So we were able to again have a tool that fits into their context. And to speak more about this is um, even as we continued implementing this, we were engaging the national uh, team uh, regarding our quick uh, uh, quality of care assessment. So uh, at that level, we also had to uh, bring in the national team and the other stakeholders like the LSTM and such. So they were able to again look uh, at this tool because um, what, 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 what we were being told is we had so many tools which um, uh, uh, were being used for assessing quality in the country. So the stakeholders together the national team sat down with the tool with the quick tool that we had and they were able to even refine it further and as we speak right now uh the team sat and refined it and come up it actually came up with one tool and and like uh, what um daniel said uh it was able to be taken up by the national government 
and that this tool will be rolled out in all the 47 counties. So for us, it was all about uh, engaging the team first, getting their buy-in, and then of course now going ahead and um, and doing the uh, and impl implementing the tool that uh, they are comfortable with. Thank you, and back to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, George. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Ellie. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, if not, I might jump in and be cheeky with one of my own. Sarah uh, and Stephen, can we have Sarah first and then Stephen? And we'll take both those questions and then the team can respond. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to the whole team. Um, really, really fantastic presentations and amazing results um, from this program. And, and you've done a fantastic job of sort of syn synthesizing those and presenting those. So well done, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the, the Facility Improvement Fund bill and um, the progress that was made in that area. And I was just interested to hear kind of what was Manny QC's role in 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 pushing that forward and and how are we able to gain traction I think I think that's something that really from my experience of working in the Manny program in Bungoma the previous um program um I think that you know getting funds to facilities was such a barrier to improving quality of care and, and service delivery so I think <clears throat> it really is a game changer so I'm just interested to hear what what money QC did and what role we were able to play and, and what kind of levers were 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 important in, in pushing that forward. Thanks. Thank you. And Stephen will take your question and then hand over to the team to answer. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um for the money QC team. Uh, congratulations. This is so powerful. Uh good job. Um, there is uh, one best practice I've had uh, from the team, the presentation um the uptake of uh, the quick uh, tool uh, by government in one of the counties will be Kuala or Mombasa um in the in the, in the spirit of uh, sustaining uh, the interventions that uh, Manic UC has implemented in uh, the four counties uh, are there any other um, uh, interventions that have been taken up by by government or any other stakeholder uh, on the ground just to ensure that uh, the exit of money does not mean um, exit of uh, the interventions uh, that you've been um, putting in place. Thank you. Thanks, two really good questions. So um, over to you, Mani, to respond to those. And then I'll allow the county team, Daniel and George, just to respond on uh, um, Stephen's question on sustainability of the interventions. So, Sarah Fox, the FIF bill, yes, we did take lessons um, from Bungoma County. Remember, as we also left uh, Bungoma, we had um, really lobbied the executive team uh, to um, have an executive order to have uh, facilities uh, generate and use funds at that level. And this really was because of the evidence that we got from, you know, the peak assessment, the PDSR uh, review meetings every time we go to a facility, and get that they have no gynecological gloves, which cost about two dollar. Yeah. So as we um, took those lessons to Kericho and Nandi, and, and and during the first year of the program, you know the same issues were coming, and then at the time we uh, we also uh, requested for the CDO to add some funds uh, to support some of these targeted health system strengthening work, and uh, so we we lobbied funds with the leadership that is the at the county level, the CEC, the chief officers and the directors of health, just to understand where the bottlenecks are and uh, whether there is any provision either to go to, an, to have an executive order or go to the FIF bill. And uh, looking at the PFM Act, it was really impossible to, to go uh, to the executive order at that moment. And that's why we, uh, we decided then to work on the FIF bill. For traction, um, the, the first thing, of course, is really that the leadership of the health department uh, were driving the process. Uh, secondly, as you know, these bills have to pass through the county assembly. We did a lot of work <laughs> really to lobby with the members of the county assembly. Uh, we were really presenting a lot of data on the Rampart scorecard, 
and really getting data up to the world level so that each of the members of the county assembly is able to see uh, uh, the skill per attendance rate in their area, uh, you know, AMC uh, attendance rate. And, you know, using such evidence is when we're able to convince them uh, really that we need this bill. Uh, the third uh, group of people that we also engage in the county treasury, as you know, this is a team that actually manages the revenues that go to the county assembly. So really, uh, uh, you know, looking through the three, uh, these three groups, but also having some of the healthcare workers, especially those who are able to access the Nidamama funds, I remember in Nandi, uh, during the MCA's meeting, we allowed one facility that was actually expending money at the source to explain, for example, you got this X amount of money and you're able to do one, two, three. So such kind of um, advocacy really help us, helped us get in the, the traction. I know, um, you know, the FIF things as they are now, they are not to the place where we really wanted uh, them to be as we uh, close the program. There's a lot of work that needed to be done and, uh, you know, developing regulation, doing the training, and really supporting that facilities come up with those accountability mechanisms that are required by the Treasury. So those are some of the work that you are really unable to do. But I'd like to welcome Daniel uh, to uh, respond to Stephen's question on the uptake and sustainability of some of the interventions in Kerry. Daniel? Yeah, thank you, Gladys. And uh, thanks, Stephen, for your question. Um, as you know, sustainability is um, a gradual uh, process. Building sustainability is basically a gradual process. And uh, for our project in the last year, we've been working around this and just ensuring that in our third year, we engage strongly the counties to ensure that they are able to uh, initiate processes to sustain the interventions that we were doing. And maybe just to give a few examples, I think uh, we engaged our, our counties even in around mentorship. Uh, Nandi County, for example, already gave a budgetary commitment to be able to enroll at least a minimum of six mentees on an annual basis. And I think that is a good number for us. I know with time they should be able to improve on that number going forward. Kericho County already uh, gave a budgetary allocation in our last year just to support mentorship, support, support supervision. And they even went further and also uh, did uh, uh, use some of the THS funds to be able to support uh, additional mentees, uh, just to have a few days for the mentors to move around to ensure that they're able to uh, to continue stre strengthen learning of the of, of the mentees in their in their peripheral facilities. And again, with regards to blood drives, you know, we've been supporting blood drives on, uh, on, 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 on some of the months that we have been implementing. But of course, uh, our support uh, might not be sufficient. And uh, the counties already gave commitment to be able to put budgetary allocation to support, uh, to, to, to have ongoing blood drives. And one, something that we learned from the counties, including during our dissemination meeting with Kericho uh, County, is that they are already transforming the leadership. As you know, uh, leadership on, on uh, uh, blood transfusion services were, was more or less centralized in the, uh, in the national government. But now the counties are already embracing it, even putting into place leadership structures at the county health, county, uh, uh, health management team just to work together with uh, the regional uh, in charges of the uh, blood transfusion uh, services satellites to strengthen that component around hemovigilance and also blood. So we are seeing uh, good results. We are seeing a good progress. And I know it is something that will be gradual. And in our dissemination meetings, we also emphasize on the need to be able to embrace all these interventions that our project was running. Maybe uh, back to you, Gladys. Thank you. Allow me to chip in also. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, just to answer, uh, yeah, yes. So, so um, during our implementation first, I mean, time with the counties, we had uh, sittings with MNH stakeholders, and that is where we were able to sell our interventions real hard. And for us, having a buy-in from the national team 
is enough sustainability is 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 a sure sustainability measure and we know that um not only will the support go to the sub county the, the counties we're supporting but it will be rolled out to all of them uh, in the country and i'll give her in an instance in Kuala where um when a bishop program uh fully Oops. Uh, we've lost you. Hi, Captain. Can, can you hear? Can, can you, you hear? Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Please continue. Yes. yes. All right. So, um, I was saying, um, so, um, when we were exiting Kuala, um, we we had meetings with the MNH stakeholders and some of the stakeholders there um, were able to see our mentorship approach and that they were able to see how it was impactful. So as we exited the Stawisha program in Kuala, uh, were able to liaise with us. They asked us how um, uh, we, were, we were implementing that particular program. And even when they went to the county asking them what activities they would wish to support, mentorship was one of the uh, activities that the county government uh, uh, told them that they would wish for it to, to, to sustain. So through the same same approach, um, they are continuing with the work there. And, 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 and I think uh, even at the county level, there's still that bits of sustainability going on. Yeah. So I'll allow Kevin to also jump in and talk about blood. Okay, if you can make that um, quite short, <clears throat> Calvin, we just have a few minutes left for Sarah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, what? So what we've been able to. Hi, Calvin. We've lost you. Uh, you you seem to be on mute. Is Okay, maybe and um, since we're running close to the time, okay. Kelvin, maybe maybe you could type your your any thoughts in the chat box. Um, and also, I'm so sorry we we are running out of time, and I know there's so much to talk about. And I see two more questions um, from Mashoud and Ellie. Please do type them in the chat box, and we'll come back to you. So thank you very much for your questions. Um, and huge thanks to the team, including Timon, who didn't present but coordinated the presentations and provided all the data showing shown in the results. So um, I'd like now to hand over to Sarah Fox as our technical director. Thank you. Well, um, yeah, really just a huge thank you to, to the whole team um, for today's presentation and for all of your hard work over the last um, few years. Um, really, really impressive results. I think some of the themes that have really struck me are how innovative some of your approaches have been. Um, I think you touched on that in some of the lessons in terms of using technology, but also just sort of the, the innovative thinking that's gone into the design of a lot of the approaches. I know there's lots of interest in your mentorship um, approach and, and some um, talk of actually replicating that may potentially in Nigeria and so I think a lot of other programs have a lot to learn from from what you've been doing um, and as Gladys said it hasn't always been an easy journey um, you know we've all faced several challenges and, and those have not been and um, that this team has not been protected from those so COVID-19 the ongoing FCDO budget cuts and then you had the additional um, local challenges around the, the strike so it, it hasn't been an easy journey but you're as a team, you've been so resilient and adaptable and flexible, and um, and that's really just shown from the amazing results that you've you've been able to achieve. Um, and and I know through through talking to Sarah that you're you know really been um, a valued and and trusted partner in the in the counties that you're working in. So huge congratulations. Um, and, and also just for, for today's session, I, I think um, the plan is that we would edit down the presentations. Um, so that they kind of become standalone um, presentations that can be shared on our website, which I think would be fantastic. Um, and, and really, there, there have been such high quality presentations, so um, I think that would be a fantastic thing to be able to do. I know that a lot of people would have liked to join today and, and haven't been able to, but we will share the recording and so that will be available. 
Um, and and yeah, just um, a huge thank you. To, uh, thank you to all the team. I, I know that some of you are were on leave and joined today from leave. So so thanks so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to suggest that we all um, all go off mute for a second and give the team uh, a round of applause to say thank you and well done. Yeah, well done. Thank you so much. Well done. <laughs> well, thank you All very right, much, care, everyone. everyone. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, bye. 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 Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.